Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Race here on Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs. During the pandemic, um, we saw many things happening uh, um, with uh, long-term care, elderly care, and those who had to be within a care facility um, simply because they could either no longer care for themselves or... um, they decided to put themselves in a retirement type of situation. We saw pictures of loved ones trying to reach each other through the glass. We saw apps come out that that promised communication. Um, And there was a lot of disconnection between loved ones family members and and those who were in long term care um, we also saw a, a lot of situations where people had some they died alone and family members were simply not allowed to cross the threshold into visiting with family members that were dying while the pandemic was on, especially um, as as things first started ramping up. In British Columbia, they're trying to put a put measures in place that would give family members a chance to actually speak up and say, hey, this is what we need. How do we get some s- something is what is what is the ground that we need to cross in order to have a say in our loved ones care and how do we have a say in what is happening within the facility so that we have a voice too let's face it a family member is in a long-term care facility you just simply want to receive information and have some sort of a voice so that you know that there's at least hope. So, British Columbia is is working on a system and Adrian Dix, Mabel Elmore, they are going to make an announcement about some of the changes that they want to have placed within uh, care facilities so that family members just simply have a say and a voice. Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Dix. I'm PC's uh, Minister of Health, and I want to start by respectfully acknowledging and recognizing the territory of the Lekwungen-speaking people, the Songhees, and the Esquimalt First Nations. I'm very pleased to be in the press theater of the legislature today with some special guests for a very important announcement that is, I think, um, significant and very close to my heart and their hearts as well. I wanted to say that Mabel Elmore, the Parliamentary Secretary for Senior Services and Long-Term Care, and the MLA for Vancouver Kingsway, uh, Kingsway. I'm the MLA for Vancouver Kingsway, right? You're the MLA for Vancouver Kensington. That's really good. Um, Nola Galloway, uh, 
the president of the Independent Long-Term Care Councils Association of BC, Kim Slater, the founder of the uh, Family Councils of BC, past founder and chair of Vancouver Island Association of Family Councils, and Heather St Stuckey via Zoom, uh, chairperson of the Interior Association of Family Councils. I, I, I am uh, very appreciative to have people here from all over, including um, the uh, Office of the Seniors Representative and others who have worked on these issues over time. I think uh, uh, the long-term care sector is um, something that has been central in our thinking uh, for this period of the pandemic. People have genuinely struggled. I know this because we've had family members in long-term care personally, and I know this um, because of the many discussions I've had in evenings with family members of long-term care who have expressed um, sometimes their frustration and sense of loss that a critical time in their loved one's life during the pandemic they weren't allowed to visit, or the circumstances that we've gone through together. I strongly believe, I strongly believe that we need to respond to what happened in the pandemic in long-term care by measures to make things better, that long-term care and other forms of senior care, but particularly long-term care, so much in the public mind a little while ago and not as much now in our discussion, should stay focused on that there is a debt owed and improvements that are required and need to be made. The voices sometimes of people living in long-term care sometimes because of their circumstances, I would say, are uh, discounted. Sometimes their family members find their roles limited and unable to influence things that are fundamental. Long-term care homes are not just health facilities, although they are. They're also people's homes. And we need to act that way as we would in people's homes, whether it's in an apartment or a house anywhere in BC. We've, of course, taken a lot of steps in long-term care to improve staffing. Our age cap initiative, we promised 7,000 new um, hires in long-term care and in fall of 2020, and we've met that challenge, and we will have passed the 7,000 number before the end of this fiscal year, which is when we said we'd do it, more than uh, 6,500, both in the age cap program and in terms of infection control and other activities that, that have taken place. We're building more long-term care beds in all parts of the province. And we've moved to improve staffing levels to meet the provincial staffing levels that we all need to meet. But this issue that we're addressing today, that of the role of residents and the role of families in what goes on in long-term care facilities in particular, um, is, is a central one, and one that a lot of us have worked, spent a lot of time thinking about, but we have not um, done, that made the changes required to ensure that family's voice and, and resident's voice is fully heard. And in many places, of course, in many long-term care homes, that's not the case. Residents' voices are heard, and you hear that. But not everywhere, not all the time, and the role has an element of the voluntary as opposed to the necessary, and it is necessary. So the person who's been working on this um, uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Health, the person who's been making this happen, is my colleague from Vancouver, Kensington, the Parliamentary Secretary for Senior Services, Mabel Elmore. And it's my honor to introduce Mabel now to make the announcement. Thank you, Minister. Today, I'm honoured to be here on the unceded territory of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees Nations, to talk about how we're taking another step to improve residential care in long-term care facilities for residents, many of whom are vulnerable seniors. The pandemic has shown us how residents in seniors and long-term care homes are intrinsically more at risk of infectious diseases and how the weaknesses of our long-term care system, such as workforce challenges, 
have implications for residents and their families. In the past two years, I've heard from constituents who are family members of seniors home residents, people working in these facilities, and advocates who are asking for reform to the long-term care system. They've shared with me invaluable firsthand experience related to the long-term care homes and ideas for how to make things better. Most important of all, they wanted the government to take steps to address the concerns for the quality of life for residents in these facilities where they call home. We agree that it's vital for government to make sure residents' voice is being heard when it comes to decisions about how the long-term care is operating to improve their quality of life, to help overcome feelings of isolation, and to give them a sense of family and a belonging to a community. This is vitally critical. With that in mind, I'm excited to announce that people living in long-term care homes and their family representatives will have more input into issues that affect their daily lives as a result of changes to the residential care regulations relating to resident and family councils. A resident and our family council is a group of long-term care home residents and are their family members who meet regularly to promote the collective interests of residents and to discuss issues of concern, similarly like a, a strata that many are familiar with. Councils may include residents, family members, and other representatives who act on behalf of residents. We're doing this so people can be more involved and those with lived experience can be at the table when it comes to promoting quality of life, resolving problems that arise, and providing input to the management of the long-term care home. Currently, some families may feel they're not able to participate in a council because they live in another community and cannot easily attend in person. They may not also fully understand their rights and entitlements in long-term care. That is about to change. The provincial government will strengthen support for councils through a number of measures. This includes requiring operators to meet more frequently with the council, as well as ensuring councils can have opportunities to meet with operators when preferred. Additionally, health authorities will oversee the formation of new regional resident family councils. These regional councils will have representation from individual councils and will meet to discuss systemic issues and share information. These networks will meet at least twice annually to share information and discuss issues with residents and families. As well, the Ministry of Health will continue to engage with health authorities, the BC Care Providers Association and the Denominational Health Association about how to enhance the councils so there is increased communication and collaboration within all licensed long-term care homes. The province is also ensuring facility operators collaborate with councils for the common good of all residents and that there are opportunities for them to learn from each other about what works well, what challenges they face and how they can best collaborate to resolve issues. And there's more. The Ministry of Health will lead a provincial committee with representatives from each regional network to focus on addressing provincial level issues. This new approach will ensure increased collaboration and communication and ensure members have more access to support information and can have open and frank conversations about their experiences. This is so important and I think this is good news for people who are in care homes and their families and I look forward to watching this progress. As I mentioned at the beginning of my speech that I've had the opportunity to talk to people around BC about, these issue, about this issue and the minister mentioned in reference the many families and residents that he's talked to have also had the opportunity to meet uh, families. There was uh, during COVID-19 we would visit uh, outside of care homes to show support for health care providers at, at 7 p.m. Uh, and also hearing from uh, family members about just the difficulties and challenges of providing care and comfort to their loved ones in care homes and the real need and desire to be part of 
the equation and to really contribute to ensuring that the quality of life for their loved ones uh, is, uh, is enhanced. So today's announcement is a result of the input from community members, the seniors advocate, and our personal experiencing experiences supporting our loved ones in long-term care homes during the pandemic. It's also a result of the hard work of Minister Dix and staff in the Ministry of Health. In conclusion, making sure residents in long-term care homes have the best quality of life possible is a priority for our government. And I want to take this moment to pass along a couple of very specific thank yous to members of the Independent Long-Term Care Councils Association of BC. Thanks for your uh, steadfast advocacy. They were previously known as Family Councils of BC and to the members that belong to the Action for Reform of Residential Care Association, commonly known as ARC BC. Thank you for your comprehensive, your unending advocacy and your uh, participation to make this a reality. All you have been passionate on this matter and for that we are very appreciative. We listened and we took action. We also respect your role as valued partners and we look forward to taking the next steps in this critical project. We know that resident and family councils have an equal stake ensuring that residents and loved ones in long-term care homes are adequately supported, that they're part of the care team, and that with this announcement, we recognize their important role and look forward to continuing to build a long-term care system, ensuring that our seniors receive the quality of care that they deserve if they live in their homes, if they live in community, if they live in long-term care homes. And so to this, our government is committed and I'm very pleased to announce this additional support for resident and family councils to ensure that they participate fully in building a quality of care for seniors in our long-term care system. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mabel. And uh, I think um, this issue is one of agency uh, that people need to have. One of the reasons, one of the things we've advocated for a long time uh, prior to becoming uh, government as MLAs was changes to the first available bed policy and those changes were made. And there are very few times that I have received on a particular issue so much, so many people coming up to me. Most recently in a Save on Foods on Main Street in Vancouver and saying that change meant the world to people, giving people in a system which does not provide much control and where our circumstances are diminished, more control and more voice is a necessary step to both reform of the system but also to treating people as we would all want them to be treated. And we've had, I think, and benefited in this area from strong advocacy from, uh, from uh, family councils across BC, existing family councils, and groups of family council organizations who've worked often with the seniors advocate in the office of the seniors advocate to, de to demand and indeed seek the very changes we're talking about today. And so it's a real honor for me to introduce Nola Galloway, president of the Independent Long-Term Care Councils Association of BC. Nola. <coughs> Thank you, Minister Dix. Hello, my name is Nola Galloway. My journey in the long-term care system began when my dad entered care in 2009. Within a year, joined by other families from our care facility, we established an independent family council. I believe that independent family councils are essential contributors to collective efforts aimed at improving quality of care and quality of life for long-term care residents. The COVID experience heightened the importance of long-term care residents and their families having a guaranteed voice in decisions that affect them. Families felt helpless as decisions were being made that tremendously impacted them and their loved ones in care, yet they had zero input into those decisions. In early 2021, under the leadership of Kim Slater, a longtime advocate working to empower the voice of residents and families, family council members 
from independent family councils across BC banded together, first establishing an association of family councils in every region of BC, and then establishing a provincial association, family councils of BC in early 2022. Their purpose being to collaborate with the health authorities and the Ministry of Health by bringing forward members, member councils' experiences, concerns, and recommendations to be discussed and addressed. The provincial association just recently incorporated under the legal entity of Independent Long-Term Care Councils Association of BC. Not having detailed Ministry of Health protocols in place to encourage and support independent family councils has made it challenging for independent councils to be as effective as they could be. But the initiative today should alleviate some of those previous challenges. We express our gratitude to Minister Dix and Parliamentary Secretary Mabel Elmore and to the Ministry of Health for enhancing and strengthening independent resident and family councils to elevate their voice, creating avenues for residents and families, and then their voice is elevated not only to the long-term care home operator, but also to the health authority and the Ministry of Health. As the President of the Independent Long-Term Care Councils Association of BC and on behalf of our members, we look forward to working collaboratively with the Ministry of Health as a valued and essential stakeholder in the long-term care sector. The announcement today will resonate profoundly with all those who have been calling for a guaranteed voice for long-term care residents and their families for years. Thank you. <clears throat> So Nola gave Kim some hype. So that's good news. That's good news. We're uh, and so it's. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, um, and I just say this from both personal experience and from uh, the experience of many people who've talked to me, that when a family member is in long-term care, whether before the pandemic or now, one's bandwidth for advocacy is uh, more limited. And it's been people like Kim Slater that have made a real difference, not just in the achieving what is being achieved today, but in bringing people together and giving people other people hope and giving other people examples of what they can do to have a voice in their uh, community and in their family's long-term care home and to give residents a voice as well. And so it's a real honor to introduce uh, Kim Slater. Thank you very much for your kind words. This initiative has a potential to be a game changer for residents in long-term care. And uh, <clears throat> so I'd like to begin by thanking Minister Dix and uh, Parliamentary Secretary Elmore and the directors embedded within the ministry who have been working with us to bring about this change. Um, thanks also to Isabel McKenzie, who has worked very hard uh, to support our efforts and our goals. And also to key researchers who toil away, uh, in our case from UBC, from UVic, from SFU, from York University, who have informed us about best practices in long-term care. Um, but also about the uh, tremendous importance of independent family councils and regional associations. I've been learning from them for 20 years. And um, that has, in fact, informed the ask that we've made of the Ministry of Health. Also, many thanks to the BC Care Providers Association, who have committed to creating guidelines new guidelines for their membership in order to um, align with these new ministry regulations and policies. But why do I say game changer? <clears throat> because historically, groups that have had a voice in decisions that are policy decisions that impact on long-term care 
have included the Ministry of Health, of course, health authorities, workers' unions, and of course, service providers. But now, the very people who are actually experiencing long-term care, up close and personal, will have a uh, guaranteed independent collective voice in policy decisions that are impacting on them. Um, finally, and to wrap up, um, I know that the implement with the implementation of this initiative, there may be policy tweaks um, or small resources that are that are necessary to make this new voice the best possible version of itself. Uh, to make sure that it's an independent voice that is both um, sought and heard by all other stakeholders. Um, and the thing is, that voice can bring a perspective that's often different than those stakeholders. Uh, so we must make sure this happens, and I'm excited to see it happen over the, uh, over the coming years. Thank you very much. Now we're going to show how flexible we are, and we want to thank uh, as well. I talked to uh, Isabel McKenzie last night. This is something that we've looked at a long time. Bruce, I got a chance to talk to her. She's, she's doing well, by the way. Bruce, she's doing well. And, uh, um, and, uh, and she would have very much liked to be here today as Bruce is on behalf of the office, but um, she's um, uh, she's obviously a strong advocate and supporter for this, and uh, and that's expressed in the news release, but it's also expressed in years of work on these issues. And we're really uh, delighted with Isabel's, both her support and, of course, her ongoing role. Now, now we get to do something. We get to show how technology hip uh, I am. Not really. <laughs> but the staff working with us, we're going to call on um, Heather Stuckey uh, via Zoom who's the chairperson who played a really important leadership role, particularly in the interior of BC. I'm so, we're so uh, honored that you're able to join us and be part of this today, Heather. So via Zoom, Heather Stuckey, the Association of Family Councils. Over to you, Heather. Thank you, Honor Honorable Minister Dix, uh, and Parliamentary Secretary, Ms. Elmore, for the opportunity to speak here today. These new regulations announced today enhancing the lines of communication between family councils, the health authority, and the Ministry of Health are incredibly welcome for those of us involved in family councils. I cannot stress enough the importance of every facility across BC establishing their own independent self-led council to give our long-term care residents the voice they deserve to enable them to deliver opinions and ideas on what is working and what is not in their own homes. My mother was a resident of long-term care for six years, and after a lapse with the help of two other family members, we re-established a resident and family council in her facility. The process of entering into long-term care can be a huge learning care, can be a huge learning curve for families and residents. In the past, there's been very little support at the move-in stage. This is something family council can help with so that the transition isn't quite involved. In my personal experience, I plunged into family council as a response to several upsetting incidences at my mom's long-term care facility. I quickly found it to be very rewarding to be part of the family council. Not only did I meet other families who were able to give, give me advice and support based on similar lived experience, but I found I was able to forge a more positive relationship with the management and staff of the facility. It is important that we understand the challenges that the operators of long-term care facilities face and offer ideas and solutions to those challenges. Operators in turn need to trust that families and friends want to help solve problems and make life as enriched as possible for residents. When operators and family councils come together and find solutions, they can share the successes of their collaboration. We need to all work together as a team. We all know that a huge obstacle right now is the shortage of employees. So the help that families and volunteers can offer in a long-term care home are fast becoming invaluable. Let's get the message out just how rewarding it is to spread love and kindness to those residents who have suffered, lo suffered loneliness and boredom during the pandemic. Communication, communication, which Minister Dix and his team has enhanced with this new legislation 
will give resident and family councils the tools to ensure that all long-term care homes are interpreting the rules and suggestions the same way so that all residents and their families will be assured they are all getting the same message and support. I would quickly like to Nola Galloway, Nola Galloway and Isabel McKenzie, airless efforts in establishing independent long-term councils association of BC, along with the five regional associations of family council, and of course, Minister Dix and the Ministry of Health. A great congratulations to everyone involved. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather, and uh, thank you to everyone involved uh, in the in this venture. Uh, in this venture, I think. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, I believe that the involvement of people means better care. And it sometimes means challenging um, uh, authorities. And that's okay. That's what needs to happen. That's what we would expect in any other venue. And having these regulations in place to protect people's opportunities to have voice protect people's access to information, to ensure the independence of family councils, and to promote people working together uh, makes a lot of sense. It's long overdue. We're doing it now, and I think this is a good moment to do that. And with that, all of us are happy to take your questions. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. We are going to start with questions in the room today. First question comes from Richard Zussman, Global News. Um, Heather spoke there of one of the critical issues during the pandemic, which was this inconsistency we saw between care homes around interpreting some of the visitation rules. In terms of these changes that come into place, what assurances are there that the province will make sure that the rules are followed consistently based on what families are saying? And extending that beyond, we hope that we don't get into a situation again like COVID where in essence, long-term care residents are separated from their families, but families would raise concerns about that through these councils. What ensures that you are actually listening and doing what these families are raising their concerns about? Well, um, first of all, it's the law that uh, information must be shared, The councils must meet. There are councils in a majority of care homes, but not in all care homes now. So this ensures, first of all, the resident and the family council voice in the activity of the care home. And that's critically important, as it would be in anybody's home, as you can imagine, whether you're a tenant, whether you're a condominium owner, whether you're a homeowner, whatever you're, whether you're part of a co-op, whatever your circumstances, we all should want and expect voice in our own homes. And so this ensures that that voice is heard and it's heard strongly and that we're supporting family councils and their role is recognized in the system. Of course, it doesn't mean that every time an issue is raised, it goes a particular way. That, that's not the case. But up to now, I think, this has been seen as an extra, where there's a care home operator that's interested in it, it works well. And when uh, families have to advocate a great deal, it works well. And one of the challenges, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Kim to speak about this as well, I think, is that um, often, people's um, uh, sense of uh, one's capacity to advocate is, um, is denied through impediments that are not necessary. It doesn't mean advocacy always ends in a result. But what it means is people will have to listen, including ministers of health, but most importantly, operators of a given care home, listen to the residents who live there, ensure that they have a voice, ensure they have agency, and that those who love them also have agency. I think that's an important change. It reflects, I think, um, at least a little bit, uh, my reflection of things we've learned in the pandemic, which is that not just that we uh, have long-term term care homes that keep people safe, that of course is a given and it's a necessity, but we also have to live our best lives even when our health lets us down and we have to be in long-term care. And it's particularly important in circumstances of long-term care where many people are dealing with Alzheimer's and other dementias and where their family members are their voice in, the, in an exchange. But it's not just that group of people. I, I would argue this provides for residents and for family members a real role 
an established role, one established in the law. It would be our expectation, and I believe we have the support of long-term care home operators in this, and some of whom are the Ministry of Health, but in the uh, private and nonprofit sector as well. And uh, I think that's a very positive thing. I'll, I'll hand it over to Kim maybe to talk about some of uh, your experiences. And the next one we're going to do for you. Oh, uh, certainly. Um, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question, actually. And COVID does provide us with a good example. Um, <clears throat> when, the, uh, when the crisis hit us all, you know, people were scrambling and so on. And um, Minister Dix and... Uh, the Ministry of Health implemented programs, uh, I can't remember the name of it, that were designed to try to keep facilities as sterile as possible. What was lacking at that time, though, was a formalized mechanism for them to ask families, look, what, what do you think about the situation? Uh, what do you folks need? And now that, that that's in place, having this formal kind of relationship between the family voice and the Ministry of Health and the health authorities and the facility, they can say, well, look, uh, we've been in uh, during the pandemic or prior to the pandemic, helping our, our residents, our loved ones by feeding and dressing and, and all of this kind of thing historically in the past. And uh, we can't do that anymore. So what's, what's going to happen to them? So now that we have that voice, we can sort of provide that heads up that, look, this needs to be attended to. And uh, you were witness to, of course, all the stories of, you know, loneliness, isolation, despair that happen as a result of it. And that's why this, this move is, is a really good move for uh, the well-being of residents, even during things like COVID. Does that make sense? Follow up, Richard. Minister, another one of the inherent challenges, obviously, is around staffing. And, you know, we'll see what, how families respond to this. But one of the issues that you may hear time and time again is around a, a lack of staffing. I know within the system it's a challenge. Like, so how do you address issues that families may raise that are systemic, that may not be something that can be solved? Well, I think, um, I think by addressing them. Um, you know this, and it's a real, it's a comparison point. I mean, we heard, we hear some of this debate sometimes. I mean, I think um, it was a betrayal of families that 88% of care homes didn't meet the province's own standards when I became Minister of Health in terms of staffing. It was a betrayal. Those standards have been set in 2008, and nine years later, they'd made no progress. And the person who brought attention to that, most particularly, including workers and, and some family councils, was Isabel McKenzie. And we made, took action to change that. And you know what it is today? Every health authority exceeds that average significantly, every one. And our care homes are funded for staffing and get staffing. You see the increase in the amount of people working in long-term care reflects that. So that was advocacy, right? It was advocacy in that case. I did previous opposition, but also by the Hospital Employees Union and others, to ensure that the province doesn't just say their standards, but meets those standards. And we did that before the pandemic, and thankfully we did. Right? So that's point, point one, and it's an important one. Secondly, we have taken exceptional action, even extraordinary action, with the age cap program to find more health care workers, such that we promised uh, uh, in advance of October 2020 um, 7,000 healthcare workers, right? Age cap, infection control, and have delivered to date, I believe, 6,700, which is pretty impressive in a time of labor challenges and other challenges. Thirdly, we took action on staffing, where we had uh, we had a huge number of people working in long-term care homes working for poverty wages. So we eliminated Bill 29 and 94, as you will know, but also in the pandemic. When the single site order came in, raised the raised the wages of those who were not in the facilities bargaining association to the tune, by the way, of 165 million dollars a year, so that they would not be working poverty wages. Can you imagine if we hadn't done that? The impact on those residents who work in some uh, uh, um, uh, private and not-for-profit long-term care homes. So we raised people up. All of those have made a significant difference. And I would expect a stronger voice for family councils will be a stronger voice for advocacy. And we see this often in children and families as well. 
the very confidentiality of the system is used to protect, to stop changes in the system that are necessary. And that's why we've taken these actions. And on this question, there is a compare and contrast. And the actions that have been taken have been, I think, exceptional and required, uh, of course, significant public investment. Our next question from the room comes from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Uh, I'm just wondering, the Seniors Advocate uh, does a survey um, of long-term care residents, and I'm just wondering what information you think you would get from these councils that might be different than what's in that survey? Uh, I think there are limitations to the survey. I'm going to ask Mabel to speak to this uh, in a moment because she's been working on these issues. I think the survey is important in that it reaches out to individual uh, family members. But surveys come once a year, right? And that report reflects just what I, I said in answer to the previous question, that we've made exceptional progress, for example, on staffing. And you look at those surveys year unto year and you see that progress and no one can argue with it. No one, that, even some of the people I can think of can't argue with it, right? It just happened. So those surveys are important. The work of the seniors advocate is important on a broad range of issues. But I think where family councils are important, and I'm going to ask Mabel and Nola to speak to this as well, is to raise issues that occur in both particular care homes. So yes, broad issues such as are raised in the survey and raised by the seniors advocate on a regular basis, such as the staffing issue I referred to earlier, but also issues in advocacy at the care homes themselves that, that are critical. People's voice feels locked out, and especially when there are not a lot of options. I talked about first available bed, but prior in 2017, you had no choice of what care home you could go to. You had to take the first available bed, and often families were locked out of the process of consultation. Well, that is not what one would expect at any other time in one's life. And now when, in a period when, for whatever reason, one's in long-term care, but partly because one's health has failed one, that the basic voice that you have in the running of your life is taken away. So this is an important change. I'd like to ask Mabel and then Nola to speak to that. Thanks. In addition uh, to the importance uh, of the annual survey from uh, the uh, Seniors Advocate, uh, the distinctive role and opportunity for uh, these family and resident councils at every long-term care home. So we have about 300 care homes, approximately 250 have some sort of um, structure in place. But, um, you know, in terms of the starting point, we need to assess that. And this is also why there's a commitment to um, resource and also support uh, each long-term care home to develop their own uh, resident and family council to get that up and running. And fundamentally, to have an opportunity uh, for them to bring forward concerns uh, at the, that local level. As well, uh, the changes that we're implementing in resourcing are so to facilitate each individual care home to develop their own resident family council, but also for them to work together in a regional structure so that they can meet, they can share resources, share experiences, best practices, find out what's going on, and also learn from each other. And then uh, facilitated through a provincial network um, with the support in uh, infrastructure as well as the health authorities for the opportunity to identify systemic issues and also raise that to the Ministry of Health. So, you know, we need to ascertain what what is going on in each of the, the long-term care homes and um, to raise it through the regional and also provincial levels. Nola? Oh, okay. Um, further to uh, the question you asked about the survey, and it's a good question, i give you an example of how family councils can contribute to that. In the most recent uh, uh, plan to build new, more effective surveys, uh, Isabel McKenzie invited myself and another part of the executive team from our provincial association to contribute ideas that would make the uh, survey a better instrument. And uh, <clears throat> so we participated with other stakeholders and it was very, very clear that we brought something to the table that would not have otherwise been considered. Questions that would uh, glean important information, you know, as they go out with their survey. And even how the survey is conducted. Uh, so, so family councils uh, can play an important part of that very uh, important project as well. Okay. <clears throat> 
follow-up vendor? Thanks, Kim. You're good? Okay. okay, we have time for a question from the phones. Dave Natalini, News 1130, for the final question. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name, my question is for Minister Dix. Um, I know there's quite a few issues in long-term care right now, and especially facing BC seniors in general. There's been um, a recent study from Statistics Statistics Canada that found that BC seniors were one of the largest groups in Canada to report not having prescription insurance to cover their medication costs. And in general, BC is having um, many residents are struggling to get insurance to cover their medication. And so I just wanted to ask you, um, how can the province better support seniors, many who live in long-term care, who may be struggling to keep up with their medication costs? Well, it's, um, uh, I would say that that's less an issue in long-term care where there's coverage, there's a particular plan under PharmaCare and long-term care than it is generally in the population. And here's how we've done it. In, um, in uh, February of 2008, we uh, proposed and made changes to PharmaCare deductibles. There's always a lot of talk about a national PharmaCare program, and, and um, I hope that it will happen in my time in elected office, uh, that initiative from the federal government. But we made fundamental changes to our PharmaCare system in 2018 to eliminate um, deductibles and maximums uh, and reduce maximums for many British Columbians, in fact, tens of thousands of them. And they're primarily seniors because it's primarily seniors who would go up to their deductibles such that if you were a senior uh, with a net family income of 26000 which is not unheard of as my friends in the in the Seniors Advocate Office here will know, if you were earning $26,000, you would be paying on your deductible the first $750 of your PharmaCare costs every year. Now, $750 is a lot for anybody. And if your net family income is $26,000, it's really a lot. And so for that group of people and up to $30,000, we eliminated that deductible. And that makes an enormous difference in the lives of people. So expanding our PharmaCare program focusing in on issues and covering things that are not otherwise covered and have not been otherwise covered are key elements of what you do. So that was a progressive way. The principal beneficiaries was, were seniors. The value of that program at the beginning was $105 million. It obviously grows out over time. And it makes, and it were the first changes of the PharmaCare program that had taken place at that time since the creation of what we would sometimes called Fair PharmaCare in 2003. So I, th I think that's how you do it, by making a PharmaCare program that delivers for seniors and, one, uh, and delivers for all people and especially um, makes improvement for those who can least afford prescription drugs. And what we found, just so we understand, and what the difference it made was this. If you look at the, the, the income of someone and their adherence to pr a prescription, which depends on their ability to pay for the prescription, it was that group of people where there was a gap. And so by eliminating deductibles, we eliminated that gap. That meant people who were following their prescription regimes and staying healthier. So it potentially has other savings for the healthcare system, but more importantly than that, any, anything else, when you get a prescription, you should be able to fill it and uh, use it to stay healthier. David, do you have a follow-up? No follow-up, thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes today's event. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you to everyone. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.